Jen, I wanted to begin, you know, given the occasion, by asking about your abiding memories of the ANU. You're a country girl from Bury. I'm a country boy from Bungendore, so I feel some affinity there. <laughs> How did you end up at the ANU, and, and what are some of those key memories from your time studying there? I come from Bury on the south coast of New South Wales. I didn't know a lawyer growing up. Um, and I guess what took me to the, to the ANU was I had a wonderful teacher at high school. I went to government schools on the south coast of New South Wales. I went to Bomadary High School, BOMO as it's known. Um, and I had a wonderful Indonesian teacher who really excited me about Indonesian language and culture. So going to Indonesia really opened my eyes to the world, to different cultures, to um, the benefit of learning a foreign language. And, you know, I was all ready to go off and do medicine or engineering or something like that. And I just decided just before putting in my preferences that actually I really wanted to study Indonesian. And so ANU was the place to go. And my mum begged me to do a vocational degree with it. So I chose law, wanting to be a diplomat. And of course, having had various vice chancellors who are foreign ministers, ANU is, is of course, the best university if you want to go into foreign policy. So uh, that's why I chose the ANU. Right. I, I don't want to spoil the journey, but sort of spoiler alert, you're now <laughs> a, a barrister at Dowdy Street, which is the sort of preeminent human rights uh, barristers' chambers here in London. Mm. And I understand recently you were in the ICJ representing a Pacific Island nation with someone who taught you international law at the ANU. I studied international law as an undergraduate and at that time the ANU was the only undergraduate law degree in Australia that offered international law as one of the core units um, as part of your degree. So everywhere else you had to do it postgraduate. And for me that was a huge part of why I wanted to study at the ANU. Um, and I, taught, I was taught international law by um, Hilary Charlesworth, who went on to become my supervisor for my honours thesis, a, one of the most remarkable women in academia and women full stop. Uh, but I was also taught by Professor Robert McCorkadale, um, and he went on to be the head of the British Institute for Comparative and International Law. Be cool. And, you know, it's quite a remarkable journey to go from this, you know, a, well, a girl from Berry becomes a lawyer, reading about international law cases, learning from Professor McCorkadale. And then last year, um, I, we, after a conversation we had at a conference, we ended up representing Vanuatu together in the Chagos Islands case and stood up together to address the court, both of us for the first time, um, in front of the International Court of Justice. So to go from being taught international law at the ANU in one of those big lecture theatres to standing up before the ICJ with my professor was pretty remarkable. I mean, you've worked on some very challenging cases. We'll come on to the Assange case in a minute. But with West Papua, obviously, it's a work in progress. Mm. And, and as things stand, West Papua doesn't have independence. No. Um, you know, there's been some horrific human rights violations. When we talk about the law as a tool for social change, do you remain optimistic, even when you work on cases such as this, where there still appears to be so far to go? Through developing the legal argument around why they have the right to self-determination, why Indonesia is occupying the territory. That has shifted the way people talk about it. I remember when I first saw the Sydney Morning Herald report West Papua is being occupied, that to me was a huge win because mm -hmm. we're shifting the way that people think about it and talk about it. And already, I mean, um, the ICJ decision in the Chagos Islands case really lays down the principles that show that we're right. Mm -hmm. And so this is something that I accept is probably going to be a lifetime uh, a you know, a, a case that I work on for my lifetime. I hope we achieve it bef well before the end of my lifetime, but that's, that's the way in which you must consider a case of this political significance, one that's so marginalised, one that we're still only just scratching the surface of global public opinion. I mean, the fact that Benny's been nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize twice is significant. Mm -hmm. Um, the fact that we have been able to address the International Court of Justice and raise it as a, as a case of international state practice. The fact that we had just last year 79 members of the African, Caribbean, Pacific Islands group of states pass a resolution in support of raising West Papua and human rights in West Papua as an issue at the United Nations. These are significant wins. Mm -hmm. So if I think about what was happening when Benny was in prison and I was a 21-year-old student, eyes jaw agape, concerned about what was happening, that's, that's a lot of progress. Yeah. The Julian Assange case is probably one that you're particularly well known for being involved in for quite a while and you know, right now mm. um, in the extradition proceedings. 
Why is a case like that important for free speech and freedom of the press? This is, without a doubt, the most terrifying precedent for free speech in our generation, and perhaps, I, I mean, it's not just me saying it. The Freedom of the Press Foundation in the United States says, literally, quote, this is the most terrifying precedent of the 21st century. WikiLeaks and what Julian does is indistinguishable in many ways from what the media does, at least in, in a legal construct. The indictment absolutely co covers typical news gathering activities. So we're talking about um, co communications with the source, receiving information from a source and publishing that information. Now, the United States is using the Espionage Act the first time in its history against a publisher. Um, and, and this raises significant concerns because the case theory that the United States is putting is that by communicating with a the source, they're basically saying that Julian is complicit with the source as the editor of WikiLeaks for having have, had those conversations received and published information. That's what the New York Times does all day, every day. That's what good newspapers do all day, every day. These publications were so important in terms of for the human rights movement, let alone just for journalism. So he's been prosecuted over having received and published the rules of Iraq's rules of engagement, which were released to WikiLeaks by Chelsea Manning, together with a video of American troops killing civilians and journalists, Reuters journalists. That is a war crime. And the reason Chelsea Manning, we presume, released that material to WikiLeaks was to say, here's the video and here are the US's own rules of engagement. Did they comply with their own rules of engagement? That was a war crime. Mm -hmm. WikiLeaks undertakes redaction processes. With the Iraq war logs, which were published by WikiLeaks, the redaction process was so intense that it was shown that the Pentagon released more information about the Iraq war through freedom of information laws than WikiLeaks divulged through publishing mm -hmm. That material. And then think about the content, the content of those releases. So what we learned from that is that the US government was lying about how many civilians had been killed in Iraq. And as Julian said, if lies can start a war, and we all know lies started that war, then the truth can stop it. And in fact, he was right, because in the end, the evidence of abuses by American forces and complicity in abuses by Iraqi forces that were revealed by WikiLeaks resulted in the Iraqi government withdrawing immunity for US troops in Iraq and ultimately was ended, ended US occupation of Iraq. Obviously, this is one case, but do you think it's indicative of a broader trend, both here in the US and globally, towards an attack? I mean, we saw Absolutely. in Australia the raids on the ABC and on, on a, a, a News Corp journalist. Does that trouble you? And this is just perhaps one of the canaries in the coal mine? I mean, I hate to say I told you so, but it's the worst form of I told you so. One, we warned that Julian would be indicted for this by the United States and face this kind of consequence, and we were right, sadly. Two, we warned that if, if this is allowed to happen to WikiLeaks, it will be used against other journalists, and sadly, that is exactly what's happening. Think about the context of the AFP raids on the ABC. What were they raided for? They were raided because of holding classified information about Afghanistan. What does that start to sound like? The precise theory that the US is using against Julian Assange, Morrison is picking that up and running with it. Mm. That's terrifying. And as we heard from the federal court this week, we don't have the tools in Australia as lawyers to resist that kind of abhorrent attack on the media. It is a growing global trend. And to, so while Julian is the first to be prosecuted and the other media partners who were in the same position as him, including the editor of The Guardian, including the editor of The New York Times, they're not being prosecuted yet, but who will be next? What have you learnt about using the law and litigation as a tool for social change? And particularly, obviously, law isn't always the answer. These experiences, what have they taught you about when law is, is the answer? The law is such a small piece of the puzzle. And actually, when you're wanting to change systemic human rights problems, that working together with social movements who can create the political um, pressure around creating that change, working together with them and with storytellers, with journalists, with filmmakers, to both take a legal challenge, because law is a language of power and it's an important lever, but working alone, it's so much more effective when you're working together with social movements and, and storytellers so that you can communicate the issue in a, in a sensible way and in a helpful way and raise awareness, but also have the, the social movement pressuring government to create the political conditions that are needed to create change.